Tonight's reading is on page 603 in the Church Bibles. Psalm 100 and chapter 4. Page 603. Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers wind. His ministers are flaming fire. He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. The mountains rose. The valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary so that they may not pass, so that they may not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them, the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, You water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen men's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them, the birds build their nests. The stork has her home in the fir tree. The high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moons to mark the seasons. The sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness and it is night when all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labour until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things, both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. These all look to you to give, to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have been. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Well, it's great to be with you. Please do keep Psalm 104 open. You'll find an outline of where we're heading in your notice sheet, Psalm 104. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul. But why? Why should I do that? The first verse goes on. O Lord my God, you are very great. But how do I know that? That the Lord is very great. Look around. Look around. We can start by looking up. Now, maybe you haven't gone away on a break this summer, but wherever we are, what any of us can do is look up, out there. And then verse one tells us, you, that is God, are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. Maybe you did get away camping this summer. Did you struggle to put up your tent? Well, God put up this universe-like a tent and it doesn't fall down. That is, the sunshine by day, the stars by night, they light up this canvas of the heavens and it's stunning. This weekend I was at a wedding reception, I got seated next to a man, I got chatting to him and uh, we asked what you were doing and what he's about. He says he does Lorentzian geometry. Uh, I confess I had to ask more what that was. And he took great delight in explaining how it's about the curvature of time and space as it bends light around objects of large mass like planets. And I did think, what an awesome God to create a universe like this up there. But you might say, what if it's cloudy, then I can't see it? Aha, uh -huh, well, look at verse 3. The clouds are in fact God's chariots, did you know that? Riding on the wings of the winds. Then verse four, those winds carry God's message as does the flaming fire, that is the lightning bolts. The point is, look up. Whatever is there that night, that day, do you see? The heavens declare the glory of God. Well, then lower your gaze, come back more down to earth. Then we see a place for everything, a place for everything. Look down to verse five. He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. You covered it with a deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. Now, you'll be aware of Genesis 1 describes the creation of the heavens and the earth over six days. And in this psalm, the psalmist generally follows the pattern of that first chapter of the Bible. We've had day one, let there be light above. We've had day two, the clouds, the waters being separated above, and just there, the seas below. Do you remember what happened on day three? Do you remember the dry land appeared? And that's described here from verse seven. At your rebuke, they fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass so that they might not again cover the earth. I mean, when someone says to you, tidy up, I mean, what do you do? Maybe you sort out a kitchen or make your desktop look a little bit more presentable. But uh, our mighty God works on a grander scale. He speaks and the seas move over there. The mountains rise up here. The valleys go down there. God separating like this, the sea from the dry land, moving the very tectonic plates of our earth, putting boundaries between them. Maybe you were on one of these very boundaries this summer as you lay on the beach. With all that set in place, the psalmist now goes on. It focuses on what God in particular is doing with that water. It wants us to see it's the water of life. So turn over to verse 10. Springs gush forth and flow. Why is that? Verse 11. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Did you learn about the water cycle? Do you remember that in school? Evaporation, condensation, precipitation. I wonder if your teachers were told you that's actually a description of what God is doing, how God is at work getting water in his world to all who need it. It's described more there, verse 13. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. We've had animals already. Trees come in verse 16. They too are watered 
abundantly. And then at the heart of it all is us, people. Verse 14, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's hearts. That last meal you ate, where did it come from? According to these verses, it's what God does with the water. That means, for example, we could have that bread roll to start, the steak and chips for main course, and then that glass of wine to round it all off. The psalmist says, our stomachs are full. Our hearts are strong. Our hearts are glad because God is good. He provides this water of life, which then gives us everything else. Well, on the psalmist goes, we've seen the place for everything. There's also the time for everything. We've reached verse 19. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows it's time for setting. Are you keeping track? Which day of creation account are we on? Day four, the sun and the moon. God gives the times and the seasons. And then the psalmist tells us the animals pattern their lives on day and night. And of course, so do we. That's verse 23. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. So put this together, times and places, history and geography, those subjects we learned about in school, again, were about God, what he has done, what he is doing. And we have this world of times and places. And in it, water gives life and everything we need. Why does God do all this? The Apostle Paul tells us, God made times and places that we should seek him. But do we? Psalm 104 begins, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Why? Because, O Lord my God, you are very great. And we've been encouraged to look around. Question is, do you see? First of all, do you see the Lord's Wisdom. Verse 24, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things, both small and great. The earth is crammed full of God's riches. A dazzling variety on display all around us is mind-boggling. So far, we've counted uh, 1.3 million species with which we share planet Earth. We are sure there are far, far more. A new species to me was mentioned there in verse 18, the rock badger. I asked David Attenborough about it. He explained it's a badger with a preference for loud music. Well, why did you take the human body? So uh, did you see in the news just this week, it was announced they've discovered a new pain-sensing organ that we didn't even know was there before. Is there no end to the intricacy of how God has made us? And we could zoom right in on the smallest scale. Uh, On holiday this summer, I read a book about quantum particles. I know, I know. But... um, (laughs) This book blew my mind, mainly because I couldn't really get my head around what it was saying. But the little bits I could understand were astounding. So from the subatomic particles to the starry nebulae, you've got land and sky and seas, parks and canyons and oceans and galaxies. This is a world children love to explore, even when we've tired of it. But scientists do give their lives to studying this universe and they discover and share with us more and more of both the complexity but also the simplicity, giving us the beauty of this stunning world. And all of it is the work of God's hand. And as we see it on display for us is the deep and wonderful wisdom of our God. That goes hand in hand with verse 26. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. Leviathan describes a great sea creature. So I wonder, have you seen Hope, the blue whale, or at least her skeleton hanging in the Natural History Museum? 
That skeleton weighs four tons. Hope herself, they reckon, would have weighed 150 tons. Why did God create such a magnificent beast? Gave her the deep blue sea. Well, this verse tells us, so she could have fun and play. You see, God is no killjoy. God is no spoil sport. Why do people think that? Look at our world. Why would anyone conclude that about our God? God didn't make us to exist, but to enjoy. What a creator. It is just too much, isn't it, to begin to get our heads around. But God is all-knowing and all-wise. And he does that so that we also see his provision Now, maybe we struggle even to keep our household plants alive, and when we go on holiday, that's the end. But um, God, far more than that, look at verse 27. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. All creation, utterly dependent on God for the sustenance that it needs. And not just what it strictly needs, to keep the metabolism ticking over. Oh no, God is stupendously generous with what he gives. We are filled with every good thing. We've seen it, our faces shine. Our hearts are glad, we are strengthened. And then there's one provision in particular which the psalmist highlights for us, which is the breath of life. Verse 29. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Well, we've reached day six. Do you remember from the Genesis account? The Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. We are alive because God gave us our first breath. So far during this talk, you'll have taken about 250 breaths, give or take. Everyone a gift from God. And that moment when God takes that breath away, there's nothing we can do. The end will then come. No more life. To dust we will return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. So bless the Lord, O my soul. Why? Because, O Lord my God, you are very great. We've been told to look around. We've asked the question, do you see? And if you do, that will lead to rejoicing in the Lord. Why did God create this universe, the world, you and me within it? Verse 31. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Here's God's plan to rejoice in his works. God's desire was to delight in what he had made. Right from the beginning, do you remember? It was good, God said. Even very good. Because it all displays his glory. The Lord rejoices, but not just him. Verse 33. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. When were you last struck by the wonder of creation? The sun on your face. The view that took your breath away. When your taste buds tingled as we marveled maybe at our favorite creature. And we saw, this shows me, the wisdom, the provision, the wonder, the power of such a generous God. And so we praise him. We get it. This is what life is all about, to make much of this wonderful creator. Not begrudgingly, not because we know that we should Not because we've been told we really must be grateful. No, our hearts have been moved. We get it. We delight in the Lord. We can't help but rejoice in the God who made us. The Lord and his people rejoicing together. 
Psalm 30, uh, verse 35. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. How does that sound to you? It's a shock, isn't it? It's so abrupt. This verse doesn't seem to flow from all we've been thinking about this evening. It just jars. It just doesn't belong. And this is poetry. That is how we are meant to feel as we read this. And then as we reflect on it, it causes us to grasp the point the psalmist is making all the more deeply. Sinners just do not fit with this creation. They jar. They just don't belong here. So who are these sinners the psalmist has in mind? Well, there was a rugby match on TV yesterday afternoon. There was a team in red and there's a team in white. You may not have been aware what I'm talking about. Mickey mentioned it earlier. But it's fair to say, had you been in Cardiff City Centre last night, post-match, amidst the raucous celebrations, it's fair to say you'd be in no doubt at all which team won. And also, may I say, is now the number one ranked rugby team in the world. And see, the thing is, we are at the heart of it. That is, we are in this world. Our senses are constantly being bombarded by blessings. God is making himself plain to your eyes and mine, to our ears, to our touch, to our smell, to our taste buds. We are in the middle of where God's glory is overwhelming. Which means that should there be someone created by this God, in this creation, enjoying it all, then to say they don't know him. Well, it's ridiculous. But it's also far more serious than that mere intellectual objection they claim it to be. I wonder if you heard about the young man Akash from northern India. He was in the news this week because for his 22nd birthday, his parents gave him a brand new BMW. And in a fit of rage, he pushed it into a river and ruined it. The press got onto this and asked him and he explained. His parents knew he wanted a jack. Don't our jaws drop at such ingratitude? And yet far more, far worse, even though there is a creator who gives to each person, in the words of the Apostle Paul, life and breath and everything else, they simply refuse to give thanks to him. People today, don't they claim to be neutral when it comes to God? Just think what that means. They look around, they look up, they take a sip, they take a bite, they take a breath, and then nothing. Shrug of the shoulders, whatever. Can't be sure about this God thing. Well, verse 35 gives us the language to describe that response. It's wicked. It is actively to reject all that God has done and given and revealed. Because the obvious right response is to rejoice in this Lord. And so this verse tells us, those who won't do that, they just don't belong. They have no place in this creation. As we think about it, verse 35 isn't actually the first verse that jars in this psalm. Back in verse 29, you remember, we heard about death. Although actually, we may not have felt it so much there as out of place, but that's only because we're so used to it. Death didn't have a place in God's original plans. It came with sin. And the psalmist has held back about talking about sin and its effects in our world. Of course, the psalmist knows there is so much that mars this world in the midst of all the stunning goodness. But the psalmist held back, really, in speaking about that, both to rightly celebrate what was good, but also to keep his powder dry. And it's now at the end of the psalm, he is not holding back. That physical death, which shouldn't be there, 
is a pointer to the truth of verse 35, that sinners do not deserve the life that God gives. And one day God will remove such sinners fully and finally. They will be no more. We must ask, must we all, where does this leave us? Well, I wonder how you have felt as we've gone through this psalm, as we've heard about all this joyful exuberance towards God that this psalm describes. Where was our heart? What were we thinking? I wonder, did you feel just a touch uneasy? Most of us here, I know, will not disagree in principle with what this psalm says. More than that, we'd agree with it. We've sung about it tonight. And yet when the psalmist talks about the desire to sing to the Lord for as long as I live, and the talk about giving glory always to God, when I realise, well, there are more than a few moments where I've fallen short of doing that. In fact, truth be told, our meditation hasn't always been pleasing to him. But if we can rightly recognise that about ourselves, then we must ask, well, Verse 35, is that speaking about me as well? And yet at the same time, we read Psalm 104 and it's obvious that it reckons there are those who rightly rejoice in the Lord. They are glorifying him. They will continue to enjoy God and his creation even after sinners have been removed. But how can that be? Well, Psalm 104 doesn't directly answer that question. But of course, this psalm does come straight after Psalm 103, which we looked at last week. And then, uh, do you remember what we saw there? We discovered those who rejoice in the Lord, just look down, if you're there, to verses 10 to 12. We're told, he does not deal with us according to our sins. And it goes on. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Well, that is amazing. But how can we put these two psalms together? How does God do that? That is, how does God remove the sin, Psalm 103, without the removing us, which Psalm 104 speaks of? But as we reflect on this psalm, we realize it does also point forward. Put it this way, as we look at this psalm, what is needed for life in God's world? Well, we've seen it. The psalm has highlighted for us water and breath. But now we realise the provision we need from God is not merely what we could call natural water and breath, wonderful gifts of God as those are. We need more. But could there be water even for sinners that will never leave us thirsty again? If you like, could there be a spring that wells up even to eternal life? Where can we get water like that? There was a man who dared to say, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And then that breath that we need Again, where could we get that? And again, there was a man who dared to say, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. That is, his words are breath and life. But how then can Jesus deliver this water, this breath that we so desperately need? Of course, we look to him at the cross. We look as he gave up his final breath so that we can breathe this new life. And as Jesus' body was broken, it was pierced. We're told it became a spring with life-giving water flowing for us. And so we can come to this psalm and it can describe us that despite our past ingratitude, shocking ingratitude, We now can be those who know the Lord, who rejoice in him. We look again at our world and we see it with new eyes or even renewed eyes. When in fact, we look around now and we see reality. We see things as they really are. We've stopped pretending there is no God or we can't be sure. We see the Lord's greatness all around us. We know it's from him. 
And so we respond as we always should have done. We rejoice. We sing. We are moved to praise him. So look around. Do you see? O Lord my God, you are very great. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Well, let's start as we mean to go on by doing that, praising the Lord right now. And we're going to join with the psalmist in doing it. So please, Bibles open if you have shut them. Psalm 104. We're not going to say it all, but we're going to join with the psalmist's conclusion where after all he has said, he leads us in the right response. We are going to say together, page 604, Psalm 104, verses 31 to 35. So together from verse 31. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles. Who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have been. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord.